Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another very exciting Center for Women's Leadership event. Today, we have a speaker who is world renowned, Dr. Diane Hamilton, to share with us the secrets to success of developing curiosity. So we're very excited for that presentation, which we will introduce you to her and some of our other uh, speakers today in just a moment. But first, I'm Dr. Jenny Walker, and I'm here to share with you an update on our research. Thank you so much for the many of you who participated in our research that we launched in June. You'll see here on the slide that the objective of that research is really to understand women's leadership in terms of the motives, the obstacles, the success strategies, and this in turn will help us provide customized resources that really speak to the needs of all of you. And so thank you for your participation. You'll see um, the data collection is now complete. We deployed the survey for two months from June to August. And it was a 20 question survey um, to really assess these three facets that I mentioned. It went out to all Ashford University students, staff, faculty, and some guests. We had 1300 total respondents, which we were really excited about and about a thousand clean surveys that we'll be using for analysis. So I know that many of you will be excited to find out what the results are of that research and we will be sharing that at the first of the year with you. We'll announce an event um, to go over the findings and some of the resources that we uh, will be crafting in response to that survey. We also have 123 volunteers for future research. So for all of you that expressed interest, please know that we're thrilled to have you on board and we will be in touch uh, as soon as we wrap up the data analysis for this survey. So thank you so much. I'd like to turn over the mic to my fellow colleague, Dr. Peggy Sundstrom, who is lead faculty for our PhD degree in organizational development and leadership. She'll be speaking with us about membership. Thanks, Jenny. Good afternoon. And once again, thanks for joining us for this presentation by Dr. Diane Hamilton. I'm really looking forward to hearing her speak. As Jenny said, I'm Peggy Sundstrom from the Forbes School of Business and Technology, but I'm also a representative from the membership committee here at the Center for Women's Leadership. We would like to invite you to become a member of the Center for Women's Leadership so you can access all the resources we will be offering members now and in the future. And for a limited time, you can become an inaugural member and your initial membership will be free of charge. Our current member benefits include speaker events like this one, a monthly newsletter, a LinkedIn group, and a mentorship program for Ashford students and alums. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about that in a minute. And of course, as a member, you will always get early notice of events and activities as they're being planned. We encourage you to join us as we expand the spectrum of benefits and provide additional ways for members to link and network with each other. Now, there's a web link on this slide that leads to the membership form, and we will be posting this link in the Zoom chat. So please take a minute to join as an inaugural member of the Center for Women's Leadership. Thank you. We look forward to your becoming a member. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the Forbes School of Business and Technology Center for Women's Leadership event. My name is Dr. Gail Haskins Long, and we are excited to tell you about our virtual mentoring program that kicks off today. Our mentoring program matches mentees with mentors through a 10 week customizable plan where you can choose up to eight modules. Some examples of the modules include the role of women as leaders. This is where you can explore different leadership styles and your leadership goals. Another module is defining success. This is where you can explore your strengths, ambitions, and risks. Another module is networking and professional development opportunities, where you can define your 
networking and professional development objectives and opportunities, as well as ways to network remotely and build your networks. Other modules include areas such as biases, verbal and nonverbal communications, and many resources and tools that you can use. To those of you who want to be mentees, have you ever admired someone in the professional world and wondered how they got there and would love to connect with them, to ask them their secrets or advice? Have you ever just needed a little extra push or a little encouragement? Well, now is your opportunity. To those of you who might be mentors, wouldn't it be great if you could share your lessons learned and to help someone be successful without having them make the same mistakes you did? Or maybe encourage someone or let them bounce some ideas off you? Also, potential mentors, please never underestimate how your experience or insights can be the change in someone's life. The CWL Mentoring Program has partnered with the university's peer mentoring initiatives and will pair mentors and mentees according to the mentee's interests and needs and the mentors by areas of expertise. Once mentees and mentors are paired, they can use the modules for guided conversations, reflections, and resources to help empower future women leaders, develop their leadership potential, and expand their professional networks. The mentor positions are open to both men and women, so men, please do not be shy. CWL mentors can be university faculty, staff, alumni, and university affiliates, such as the Forbes School of Business Advisory Board and Program Advisory Committee members. The CWL Mentoring Program Committee reviews mentor applications to ensure their fitness and disposition for the success of the program. Potential mentees. If you are a current student, alumni, veteran, active duty, or military spouse, sign up today and be paired with a high achieving successful leader. Next slide, please. Following the application process, both synchronous and asynchronous orientation sessions will be offered to new mentors and mentees. The application links are on the slides and we'll post them in the chat area as well as a link to a flyer. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you join the mentoring program through the CWL. Remember, you can even join as early as today. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Gail, uh, for this very inspiring invitation to join. I will certainly do it today. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Irina Weisblatt. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Diane Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton is the founder and CEO of Tanera and co-founder of DIMA Innovations, which are consulting and media-based businesses. She is a behavior expert and nationally syndicated radio host and a keynote speaker. She has authored multiple books which are required in universities around the world, including Cracking the Curiosity Code, the key to unlocking human potential. She is the creator of the Curiosity Code Index Assessment, which is the first and only assessment that determines the factors that inhibit curiosity. Her groundbreaking work in the area of curiosity helps organizations improve innovation engagement, and productivity. Thinkers 50 Radar chose her as one of the top minds in management and leadership in the year 2020. Diane's work has been endorsed by some of the most respected names in business and leadership, including Steve Forbes, Keith Craig, Ken Fisher, Jeff Hoffman, and Vern Harnish. Welcome, Diane. Well, thank you. It's so nice to be here. I want to make sure my camera's on. Just a minute. It's not letting me in. There we go. <laughs> 
it's nice to meet you guys. I'm glad you're all here. And this is such a great event. I'm very excited to speak for the Center for Women's Leadership here at Forbes School of Business and Technology about a topic that I find so important, and that's curiosity. And so I want to begin with a question. I mean, I think a lot of people ask me this, and that is, what is curiosity? And a lot of us look at it as something that is about exploration or learning new things, and it is. But what I want to focus on today is how it helps us get out of status quo thinking. So how are you having your curiosity get you out of status quo ways? And how is it holding you back somehow that you're not developing your sense of curiosity? And one of the ways that we can talk about status quo is to look at a famous thought experiment that I think is really interesting. Uh, you've probably seen National Geographic play it on television. If not, it's, it's something that I think is really important to showcase how powerful status quo thinking can be. Uh, they put a, a hidden camera into a doctor's office and a woman went in thinking she's getting her eyes examined. But uh, unbeknownst to her, it was actually a thought experiment to see how much people go along with status quo thinking. So everybody around her were actually actors that were in on it. And every once in a while, a bell would ring like that and everybody around her, the actors, would get up and sit down with no explanation. And this happens a few times and she looks befuddled, but eventually she stands up and sits down along with everybody else because she was uncomfortable. Everybody else was doing it. So they thought this is really interesting. She continued to stand up and sit down with the group and they wondered what would happen if they took the people out of the room, see what she would do when she was alone. So one by one, they called them back as if they were getting their eyes examined. And when she was alone, when the bell went off, she still got up and sat down. And so they thought, well, let's add some people to the room, see how they respond to her, see what she does when we have people who aren't actors with her. And as soon as uh, somebody sat down next to her and the bell went off, she stood up and sat down. And he looked at her so confused and said, why did you do that? And she said, because everybody else was doing it. I thought I had to do it. So what do you think he did when the bell went off along with her and everybody else who came in the room, they all got up and sat down. Now this is called social learning. We all feel this sense of comfort when you can do what everybody else is doing. But we find that when you do that, you lack the, the passion to become innovative and to do new things. And, and that can lead to a lot of problems that we're seeing. So that was my interest, you know, curiosity has led to so many amazing things from the Model T to a head to flying cars or whatever's next on the horizon. And so if we can understand the value of curiosity and how it ties in to all the things that leaders and people in their lives want to have happen, that's what my interest was. So I wanna just take a look at, just give you an example of what curiosity means in terms of how it, it, it impacts other things. And I can do that with you think about baking a cake. Think about this will come back to curiosity, I promise. You're gonna bake a cake and that's your end goal, right? And you think about what do you need to do to bake a cake? You need ingredients. You need to have oil and flour and water, whatever it is you need to mix together. So you put in a pan, you put it in the oven, you hope to get cake. You will, you will get cake if you turn on the oven, but if you don't turn on the oven, you get goo, right? So it, it's the, the spark to getting your cake is necessary to turn on the oven. And in the working world, instead of cake, if our end product is to be financially successful, to be productive, we know that the companies are looking at the ingredients of what's important, engagement, innovation, soft skills, motivation drive, all those things. And so everybody's mixing together all these ingredients, but nobody's actually turning on the oven that sparks, that makes the cake, that makes this end product that we're trying to do. And that spark, is curiosity. And so I want to take a look at curiosity and, and why it's important. So if, uh, we can go to the next slide. I, I think it's really important to think about what we had as kids. And I love the picture here on the right. And I, I think these little girls are just this is so funny to me because they're at the San Francisco Museum of Art. And what are you supposed to do when you're at the museum? You're supposed to look at the art, right? But they're looking behind this vent because they're curious what's back there. And we're all curious when we're born and we grow and we become more and more curious and, and then something happens, right? Is your, could be your parents, they get off the floor, you're getting dirty, right? But we all have this really innate sense of curiosity that uh, the, make, the Max Planck Institute 
uh, coined the term the curiosity gene. And everybody's got this, but even animals and birds. If a bird flew around a bush and never had curiosity, once it ran out of berries, it would die. We need this curiosity to explore, to go to the next place. So that is, is something that we all have in common. And these three-year-olds, like these little girls, were asking all these questions, 100 a day. And then look at what happens around age five. It's very similar to what we see with creativity. There are some great talks on uh, curiosity creativity. If you haven't seen Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk, or if you haven't seen George Land's TED Talk, those are two must-sees. And I know we don't have a lot of time here today, but I, I think they tie into what we saw in my research with curiosity, that we peak around this age of five, and then something happens and we lose it. And as we go through these different ages, by the time we're into adulthood, it's, it's not where we want it to be. So I think that that's really important. And I, I've discussed this, I, as uh, Irina has so kind of mentioned, all the things I do, I, I, one of the things I have is this nationally syndicated radio show where I talk to some of the most interesting people alive. And uh, I wanna just touch on some of the things that I've learned from them. And I know this next slide is busy and I only put this much content on it for later so that when you have it, you can look back at it. But tr try to not focus in on reading it because what really what I want you to know is some of the people I've talked to and what they say is the value of curiosity. So why should we care about this? Well, we're losing tens of billions to hundreds of billions of dollars in emotional intelligence uh, related issues in leadership and collaboration issues and in engagement issues. And if you're not familiar with emotional intelligence, it's that ability to understand your own emotions as well as those in others. And the big voice in that realm is Daniel Goleman wrote a great book about why your EQ or the measurement of your emotional intelligence, which is your emotional quotient, can matter more than IQ. And the biggest part of emotional intelligence in, in some respects can be our empathy, our ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes and see things from their perspective. And to do that, you have to be able to ask questions. And when Daniel was on my show, we talked about this and he thought of curiosity as just the competency of the future. It's so critical to develop emotional intelligence. But since this is a women's forum, I wanted to point out two amazing women who talked about leadership, curiosity, communication and conflict on my show. And they're both from Harvard and they both have written some amazing pieces. Francesca Gino, did a wonderful piece in HBR. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend researching her work because she made a case for why curiosity is so critical in the workplace. And the one thing that she really pointed out when we were talking about this is how many leaders think they encourage curiosity when in fact, people who work for them don't really feel like it is encouraged. So there's this disconnect of perception involved. And that's really important to consider because as she pointed out, it's tied to curiosity is tied to so many things that we're trying to improve in the workplace that help with communication and conflict, which would save companies money and make everybody happier if we could all get along. And uh, engagement is one of the other really top issues that people struggle with in the workplace. Gallup does a big survey every year and they found that we're losing 500 billion a year from people just going to work as walking dead, not interested in what they do. And that's a huge problem. There's been great leaders like Doug Conant at Campbell Soup. I've had, you know, I've talked to him about what he did to improve it. And a lot of it was curiosity based, asking people what made them passionate about their job and then following up with handwritten notes to inspire them. He said he wrote more than 30,000 notes. He looked a little exhausted when I asked him about that. But, you know, there's there's things we can do to engage with people and ask them questions, find out more. And one of the people from Novartis who really does that well is, is Simon Brown. And on the next slide, he, what he did is part of what they're doing at Novartis, which I think is really critical to look at some of these companies of what they're doing. And I just listed some of my favorite ones here. And I know we don't have a ton of time to go through what all of them are doing, but I do wanna say that Novartis does a lot to inspire curiosity in their employees. They have uh, Curiosity Month in September. So the last two weeks I was speaking and, and some of their forums and they brought in 180 people to do these little miniature talks about different things to inspire curiosity in their employees. They reward their employees for uh, a goal of 100 hours a year of uh, in curiosity based learning because they know if people can explore these different areas, maybe they'll 
find jobs and tasks and things that align really well to their interests. They also have their employees do uh, presentations, kind of like a mini TEDx events where it's the employees presenting and no better way to learn something than they have to present it. So they do a lot of these things to inspire people. That and book clubs and all these other things are really uh, making Novartis one that stands out as a major pharmaceutical company. And Verizon, uh, Verizon is very much based on establishing curiosity. And to do that, you have to embrace it from the top. Leaders really have to buy into this, and they do there. Uh, right before all this coronavirus, I was in New York filming little vignettes that they create for their employees that they filmed me for a little bit talking about curiosity, but then I, one of their employees, she gave her story about how curiosity helped her succeed, and she became very successful within the company based on it. So these are great little things that they do. They play these for hundreds of thousands of people to listen to, and they have it in their onboarding programs to show employees, potential employees, this is what we value. This is our culture. You have to embrace the culture from the top and have it go down to all levels. And that's something SurveyMonkey definitely did. Uh, Xander Lurie was on my show, the CEO there, and he embraces curiosity so much, they changed the name of their company address to One Curiosity Way or something to that effect because they everything they do is curiosity based. Um, just want to share a couple products because I think they're interesting that they came out of curiosity. Uh, Velcro uh, it came about from a guy just walking his dog and questioning why the burrs wouldn't come out of his dog's hair took the burr under the microscope, looked at it, and thought, huh, it's got a hook and eye that kind of thing that works. Maybe I could recreate that. That curiosity led to an incredible product. Monopoly increased their uh, distribution of their product. I mean, we all know the Monopoly comes out with the cat version, the dog version, the Star Trek version, whatever they had, right? And they wanted to come up with something new, and they used their curiosity to research how people uh, play Monopoly. And what they found was 50% uh, of people who play Monopoly cheat. I'm sure it's none of you, only 50%, they're all not here, uh, cheat. And so they came up with the cheaters edition of Monopoly, which was their second biggest launch of all time. So that was a huge thing that they were able to do by asking questions and exploring. And it, the reason some of these companies aren't successful, like the Kodaks and the monopolies of the world, is because, because they just keep relying on status quo ways of doing things. This worked great in the past, let's just hold on to that. And then, and then they crash. And that's something that Ben and Jerry's is very careful not to do. They are known for having ice cream, as you probably know. And not all flavors stay popular forever. And instead of trying to make them stay popular and try uh, making people like something they don't like anymore, they celebrate when they're finished and they decide to take them off the market. They actually give them a funeral on their website. They put a headstone, they put dates of when it was popular, they celebrate the success, and then they move on to the next thing. So I, I think that all these represent really creative um, ideas that come out of curiosity. Um, as far as Van Moof is another example because they create these hybrid bikes and they had a lot of them damaged in shipping, and they couldn't figure out how to fix this without spending a lot of money on increasing the carton size. So they thought of everything, they couldn't figure it out. They looked at what else has a similar type of shipping package and wanted to see how they did it. Well, they found out that flat screen TVs had a very similar box and the flat screens weren't getting broken. And they're thinking, how's that happening? Then they realized that they printed a picture of a flat screen TV on the front of their boxes. And they thought, well, what if we did that? Just a few extra pennies for ink. And they had a dramatic uh, decrease in the amount of breakage. So that's a huge example of how do you think outside the box? Disney improved turnover in their laundry division just by asking employees, how can we improve your job? A hospital in London improved their death rate on transferring patients by looking outside their industry. They went to, uh, a Formula One race car team to see how they were so efficient and had them come in and look at their own processes to see how can they help us. So I give you all these examples and I know I'm going through them so quickly because I want you to see the value of what companies have done and how you can think outside your box, outside your cubicle, outside your silo, outside your industry for ideas. So 
Um, I want to go on to the next slide because as I was researching this, this is what led to me uh, looking into curiosity. And what I found was there is a lot of uh, work out there about curiosity. There's researchers who have you know, created assessments and there's people who've written books. I listed some names here. If you haven't read Carol Dweck's book, Simon Sinek's book, or Daniel Pink's book, they're really great for looking at mindset, motivation, drive. But again, a lot of the things they're writing about don't give you the answer to how do you spark what's stopped this curiosity. And I, I looked at a lot of the curiosity tools out there to see what was available. And you may have researched this in some of your classes that there's like big five factors of personality assessments and all these ones that look at openness to experience or whatever they're looking at. But no matter how they looked at curiosity, it was all if you had a high or a low level. So if you took a curiosity assessment, all it would tell you is your high, low, medium or whatever. But if you had a low level, then what do you do? And that was frustrating to me. And uh, as I was writing my book on uh, fixing, you know, curiosity, I thought, well, how can you fix it unless you know what stops it? So I started out by putting a thread into a LinkedIn group and asking people, what keeps you from being curious? Got a lot of the answers I would expect, but it just kind of set me on this path to see, well, what, what is it out there? So I actually researched this myself over years of um, thousands of uh, surveys. I used SurveyMonkey to get data and I went out and I found that there are really four factors that hold you back from being curious. So are you curious? The next slide will tell you what those four factors are. And I created the acronym of FATE, F-A-T-E, to remind you. And I want to look at these because as a women's group, I think it's kind of interesting to compare some of this for men versus women uh, and just in general what they mean. So let's look at fear really quickly because fear is the biggest one I heard on LinkedIn. People were saying this quite a bit. But what was interesting to me when I got my research back that all of these were pretty equal. Fear wasn't any more than the others. They were all very much problematic for people in, a, in the same way. So I think it's fascinating to look that fear seems more of an issue for women. And the, the one thing that we find with women um, is that they're more likely to hold back and, and fear looking bad, looking embarrassed, look, have that sense that people don't think that they know as much as they, they should know. But to be honest with you, the levels were very similar on most of these. It wasn't dramatically different for men than for women. But I think if you're working on fear, see, these are the things that I, when I work with companies, we go through 36 questions and we go through one by one, all the different areas. But just to get you started on your own to, to work on fear, think of things that hold you back. Say you're in a meeting, what would keep you from asking a question? And think about this. I, I've had, you know, I've seen leaders who will say things like, don't come to me with problems unless you have solutions. We heard that. That was like a great thing to say in the day we thought, right? But all that does is the people who have not been qualified to give you solutions won't tell you your problems. And that's bad. So that's one of the problems that we're seeing with fear is leaders inadvertently sometimes shut down people and their ability to ask questions and feel comfortable and confident. Just like we saw with Francesca's research that they think that they're helping people be curious, but sometimes what they say can intimidate people or make people say, hey, I'm not gonna ask that question. So maybe write down on a piece of paper, what things kept you from asking questions in the last meeting? Were you afraid of looking dumb? A lot of us do that. Hey, Bob, why don't you ask the question, you know, so I don't look dumb, right? People don't wanna ask questions sometimes. But if our leaders embrace curiosity, we'll embrace curiosity. So we need to, uh, as leaders, you know, emulate what we want to see. The, the next area is assumptions. And assumptions is that voice in your head. Think of all the things you tell yourself. Oh, I learned that in the past. I didn't like it. Wasn't interesting. My, uh, that's just something I wouldn't want. It'd be too much time. I mean, we tell ourselves these things. And uh, I think it's kind of like that voice is this weight. It's kind of like if you, you know, I, I hold up a bottle of water and when I give talks sometimes, they'll say, how heavy is this? And people will yell out six ounces, 10 ounces, whatever they guess. And I'll say, well, it doesn't matter. What matters is how long I hold it. If I hold it for a little while, no big deal. And a little longer, my arm starts getting tired. And I hold it all day, my arm feels paralyzed. Well, that's kind of how it is 
with uh, our thoughts. If you just have a fleeting thought, no big deal. You hold on to it a little longer, it bothers you more. And you can keep holding on to it, it paralyzes you. So we need to put the water down. We need to get those thoughts and recognize next time you have a thought in your head thinking, I'm not gonna like this, that's not gonna be something I'm interested in. Why do you think that? Just analyze it a little bit. And then what can you do to maybe give that less power over you and try something you haven't tried? And then technology. And technology was one that really kind of fascinated me. I didn't even expect that as a factor. And, but then as I thought about it, it made sense because we over and we underutilize technology and a lot of people become reliant on it or they, they don't uh, understand it. Uh, think about if somebody threw you a calculator and never taught you the foundation behind it, how you might have been the greatest mathematician in the world and yet you don't, you'll never know that because they never taught you that. So we need to work with people on the foundations behind things and we need to have that foundation building training. But then we also need to learn once we have this technology, how can we utilize it to do something amazing and go outside our industry, go outside of our silos and things and figure out how this, this works. So think about that. I mean, I know each generational differences I've seen in general though, these were pretty much equal as for men and women uh, for how much it impacted them. But a lot of people get kind of used to having their Echo or Siri or whoever <laughs> answer their questions for them. So sometimes you look up the foundation behind things the next time you, you think and then ask yourself, well, where did that come from and why? And go a little deeper. And uh, technology can be kind of overlapped with fear and, and environment. And some of these overlap to some extent. You can fear technology, for example. But with environment, sometimes environment can help with technology or um, hurt with it. Uh, environment is really everybody that you've ever known, who you've ever known, I should say, in your life, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your peers, social media, you name it, that's your environment. And an example of a positive environment in, uh, uh, influence is Steve Wozniak. Uh, he wrote a book called I Was, in which he wrote about his father who uh, helped him create things as a kid. He brought home wires and gadgets and batteries and he taught him how to put it together into how technology works and he explained the reasoning behind things. Now he created a guy who later went on to co-create Apple out of that. But how many of us had parents who really did that? How many of us had siblings who were kind of ruthless and so that's stupid or who, how many of us had teachers who said, hey, I've got 35 kids in this class, I can't answer every question. Those kinds of things are what Ken Robinson and George Land talked about in those TED Talks. And I really hope you check those out because our education system has sometimes educated people out of these competencies. So if you look at it, do you post something on social media? And if somebody doesn't like it, do you want to take it down? Or how much of this is impacting you? What can you do to overcome this? And so when I train these courses um, and in these training classes, as we go through the 36 questions of all the things that hold people back, I have them do kind of a personal SWOT analysis, which is really your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and think about them for each of these questions and just create SMART goals, make them measurable of little baby steps of ways to overcome them because these are things we can overcome. Um, I, and I know that it's really interesting to look at the differences in, in the opportunities and how men and women differ. And, and the next slide's a little bit busy, but I, I did that so that you can have this for future reference. So without trying to figure out the slide, let me just tell you what it, what it means. What, this is out of Cambridge, but basically they were looking at how people reacted after a seminar. Say they listened to somebody like me or somebody in a live setting talk, and they wanted to see um, how men and women were likely to ask questions or not ask questions at this event. And what they found was men were more likely, two and a half times more likely, in fact, to ask questions than women, because women felt uncomfortable uh, just even pointing out issues. Uh, if they thought something was wrong, they kind of thought, well, maybe it's my fault that I saw something wrong, where men are going, hey, you got a typo up there, and they have no problem pointing it out. So there's a difference in the confidence level, I think, and a lot of that can be from experience of how much time we've had uh, not in the work setting as much as men have had. There's a lot of factors to this. What's interesting is there's not a ton of research uh, about some of the reasoning behind this. And that's why I think my research got so much attention because 
we need to do more. But we did find out that men are more confident asking a question uh, early on. Say nobody's asking any questions, they're happy to raise their hand. Where women, you know, six questions in, they're thinking about it, but 15 questions, all right, I'll finally ask something, right? So there is a difference. But in the sake of curiosity for curiosity's sake, uh, men are much more interested in academic kind of questioning and women more for the experiential openness to experience kind of thinking. But the differences aren't dramatic. You would, you know, I mean, there's some research, uh, Merck did some research around the world of how different groups are, are um, you know, more curious or less curious. And we know that large corporations are more curious than smaller corporations. And, you know, we know different aspects of curiosity are different in different areas of the world, but it's not that different. And it's, it's fascinating to me how much more alike we are than we are different. But um, I do think that what the most important thing we can do is write down some of these things. And I want, I want you to take this next slide home. And you know, if you have a chance to have a ca screen capture of this somehow or, or the, follow this presentation later, because I've broken down some action items for you. On, uh, on the next slide, the left side of the screen is for leaders and the right side is for individuals. So we've kind of talked about the right side of the screen, writing down why don't you ask questions in meetings and coming up with reasons for some of the ways we can um, overcome that in personal uh, goals, smart goals, measurable ways that we can uh, overcome our fears. With assumptions, what are you telling yourselves? Write those down. Why, why won't this interest you and what can you do to move forward? With technology, have high tech and low tech days. Find out how you're under and over utilizing things. And what, if you feel overwhelmed, you, you know, you're only going to get farther behind if you don't uh, start now to try and, and build up those skills. So these things are important to recognize. An environment, consider who has impacted you. And maybe, maybe they weren't right when they told you that was a stupid thing. Why would you be interested? Maybe this is something you'd really want to do now. And for leaders, uh, I know that um, I think the slides moved a little bit in the transferring over here, but you get the idea. These are some of the leadership issues that leaders struggle with. And so when I train companies, we, we do these personal issues first. We go through all these 36 issues of how can we repair all these things that hold us back personally. But then we look to the leaders and we find out what are the things within their company that they're trying to repair. And now the, in, the individuals in the company are able to give feedback, kind of like what Disney did when they had low, uh, they had high turnover in their laundry division. They went to their individuals and they said, how can we improve your job? Thinking, you know, they'll probably give us stuff we can't do anything with. But they did get great things back. They got, you know, have an air vent over my desk so I'm not so hot. Have a table that moves up and down so my back doesn't hurt. And that's kind of what we do in our leadership part of the training is we find out what the leaders want to know. How do we help perception, teamwork, adaptability, all the things that we're trying to do. We go right to the employees who are learning how to develop their own curiosity and we find that they give great suggestions that we bring back to leaders. And so they don't have to have their name associated with it. We have this anonymous uh, supply of how to fix this. And so if you're a leader, look at these 10 questions here of um, how you can have this intent to understand uh, how curiosity can help these issues. So this is something I recommend printing out later. I know it's, it's a lot of content for a situation like this, but it, it's something that I really think needs focus. And a lot of people just assume that there is a curious culture, that everybody's doing the, their things that they think they're doing. And if we don't pursue going to the horse's mouth with our employees, if we don't tell our boss that we, we want to ask questions, if we don't do it from both sides, we're not going to develop this culture of curiosity. Now, on the next slide, I, well, I think this is a really important slide since this group is women. And I, I did some research about some of the top women leaders and um, who they were and, and what they, they thought was important for their success. And I took most of these from the Fortune 500 list, uh, but I also took Oprah, since everybody knows her, and Mae Jemison, Jameson, uh, Jemison, I should say, who was the first African-American uh, woman astronaut, who was super impressive. And I thought, you know, I wanted to see when they asked them what they thought was important for them to be successful, what they came up with. And what they came up with, if you look in red, they almost 
all of them listed something that sounded a lot like curiosity, if not exactly curiosity. Openness to experience really is curiosity, asking questions, curiosity, challenging the status quo. All of those things are what we're trying to do. We want to get leaders to recognize that to be innovative, to be engaged, to do all the things that they're trying to repair in the workplace, it's not going to happen unless they light that spark of curiosity. And these are some amazing women who get it. And I've had men and women both who are in the top leadership positions. And no matter who's on the show, no matter who I talk to, they all say curiosity comes first. And I really uh, hope you realize that future does belong to the curious people, the ones who aren't afraid to try it, explore it, poke at it, and question it and set it free. And I want you to think about this and how curiosity ties into what we said at the beginning with status quo thinking. What are you doing just because everybody else is doing it? Are you asking why, why not? Why do we have this? What could we have different? Are we just doing everything because everybody else is doing it? And what are you gonna do the next time you hear? Are you gonna stand up and sit down and not ask questions? Or are you gonna wonder why? I hope you wonder why. Thank you. And I'd love to be able to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, this was wonderful. We have so many questions, <laughs> so which is which is wonderful. I just I just captured all the questions from the chat pod, and I thank my, our audience members. We have so many questions. Hopefully, we can go through each one of those questions. So the, the very first one is uh, several people actually uh, mentioned the concept of trust. So how does trust positively or negatively impact curiosity? Well, obviously, if you don't have it, it, it positively is a bad thing, right? We know that we have to have trust. We know that leaders sometimes lose trust. And I think a lot of leaders don't recognize that. And one of the things I talked to Daniel Goldman about uh, when we were talking about emotional intelligence was how accurate it is to get an emotional intelligence uh, indicator of how we are as leaders. And he really was adamant that we need a 360 evaluation of how others view us. Because a lot of people don't recognize that they've lost the trust. And it, for you to really have that sense that you can go to your leader and, and ask questions and not think that they're going to shut you down is going to be a, a problem for a lot of people. That's why I think a lot of people help, uh, it helps them to have a kind of a, a buffer statement before they ask a question. So Maya, if you're my leader and I went to you and I wasn't sure I would be insulting to you to ask a question, I might say, you know, I'm trying to develop my sense of curiosity. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I ask a question that maybe, you know, I know I don't know and I, I just wanted to see if you might know. If you show them that you're not questioning their authority and you're trying to catch them in something, or I think that a lot of leaders are afraid that you're going to know they don't know as much as they think they, that they should know. And I, one of the great leaders I've worked with is Keith Kroc, who is the former chairman of of DocuSign and now an undersecretary in Washington. And he has a following like you cannot believe. He's the best networking guy I've ever met. And I was fortunate he wrote the foreword of my last book. He has this ability to have everybody trust him. They'll do anything for him because he's very humble. It's the guys who come across as, uh, you know, I know everything and I'm a puffer fish that'll make people not want to come to you with suggestions, with questions, mm -hmm. and then and then you're you're killing trust in the company. Yes, we have to we have to trust someone to be comfortable, and I think comfort and comfort mm -hmm. is very important for the curiosity as well. In order for us to express our curiosity, okay. uh, one of your slides says curiosity slash creativity. Does it mean that these two words concepts can be used uh, interchangeably? If so, why? And if not, why not? That's a great question. Um, no, they shouldn't be used ex the same. I, I have them as they both had a very similar curve, and that's why I put them on the same slide. But I've asked a lot of creativity experts, uh, and I asked them what comes first. They all have told me they believe that curiosity comes first. So you, curiosity is about questioning and exploring and getting out of status quo. And once you get to that point, you come up with inventive ideas, that creative sense that I could do this in a unique way. So they are not the same thing, although they mimic the same patterns. And so that's why they were on the slide at, at, 
uh, in the same respect. But if you listen to Ken Robinson's or uh, George Land's talk, they do talk a lot about creativity. And a lot of the same things that limited creativity limited curiosity, including education and other factors that they talk about. And it's really interesting if you look at George Land when he says, you know, I mean, can't remember exact percentage, but it was, I think, 98% of two-year-olds were creative geniuses. And then by the time they were 31, it was the exact opposite. I mean, it's just, it completely gets killed when you get to be an adult. And that's what we want to get away from. He studied that at NASA, and it's really interesting research. So I hope some time you take some time to, to watch that. There were several uh, audience members that would like for you to share some of the resources uh, as you were uh, going along. So we'll make sure to chat with you after afterwards yep. to capture some of those links and some of those uh, resources, some of those tech, tech talks that you mentioned. Well, you know, uh, I would as you mentioned that, I would like to add something, Maya, I hope you don't mind. Um, and I, I do have a lot of these resources are available at developcuriosity.com. I did a free course that has all these videos and links to different things in there. And so if you're looking for a lot of that, it's really simple and it's free. Absolutely. And we'll post some of those resources as well and the resource to your website where you have many of those and many interviews uh, with the experts that you were referencing throughout your uh, presentation. The next question, as a woman leader, how do you effectively harness and leverage employee member curiosity uh, as you're working and realizing organizational objectives and goals? I'm not sure I understand the question. You're trying to reach your goals and Say that again, Maya. I just want to make sure I can so, answer. So to, to, to summarize the question is, mm -hmm. you are trying to inspire and promote your employees' curiosity, but at right. the same point of time, you're under pressure. You're trying to, to reach the objectives and the goals, okay. and those two sometimes don't always go hand to hand. They don't. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for restating that, because I spoke for uh, International Project Management Week, where we got into that quite a bit, because project managers can't get off track. They have deliverables they got to get there with you know doneness has to be there and so that's a challenge but you know if you don't recognize that you have to have uh, proactive thinking you have to have foresight I've taught a lot of courses in foresight at different universities and, and part of that is preparing for the unknown and right now what could be more unknown than what we're dealing with with COVID and everything yeah. else right and no one who who could have possibly been that crisis ready uh, aware of what the possibilities could be but the ones who were, who were flexible and agile and were able to adapt and pivot slightly um, are, are doing a lot more um, things that, that are helpful to their business. And if you're just so structured that you can't be, you're so concerned that you're not going to hit your deadline, sometimes you have to, to miss a deadline to, to find a better option. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that. I, I worked on a lot of boards and one of them I work for is here in Arizona, which is for um, Radius AI is a software company. And they created a software that does tracking of people's behavioral patterns. And it was a great software. But then when COVID came out, immediately they used that software to track if you're washing your hands or if you're taking, you know, the, touching something that needs to be cleaned or, you yeah. know, they, they, you have to be able to pivot. And if you can't have that flexibility, if you're so concerned that you, you could only do this thing and you don't let people ask questions, you're going to be stuck when we get a crisis like this. Absolutely. It's definitely a balancing act. Definitely a balancing act. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, uh, many faculty members that joined us uh, today, and uh, uh, one of them is asking, uh, how do we incorporate curiosity into college student assignments? You know, it's really interesting because I just wrote a MOOC that is a massive open online course that's out in Europe and all around the world, and it just launched, and it was really fun to write a course about curiosity. Um, I also uh, am working on a curiosity journey as part of an app that Reid Hoffman, the guy who created LinkedIn, um, he's got this app called Flourish You that's coming out that they're creating a curiosity journey in. So I, we have been trying to, to do this in the courses and things that I've been working on. And part of it is letting people um, ask questions and explore, which I know we do at Ashford and a lot of the other universities out there, they do a lot of question asking, but it's also about developing critical thinking skills. You have to have the ability for people to support their, their thinking and their reasoning behind any of their ideas that they come up with. But for curiosity, 
Um, I, I think you can incorporate different activities. Actually, I don't have it, I have it this morning. I was looking at this. There's a Lego uh, set of, for adults to, to develop curiosity that I just asked the guy to be on my show today. I want to talk to him about how he's doing this because I know I've used Legos in my Myers-Briggs training to show people how different teams work well together to develop uh, creativity and um, curiosity of how to do things. And then, you know, what was interesting when you put a team together of people who are all the same, putting together a Lego, you tell them to build a house out of Legos, they'll all build this really boring house because everybody's the same on the team. But if you put a team together of everybody who's different and, and diverse, you get this like castle and moat, really cool <laughs> things. <laughs> so the curiosity sometimes comes from putting unlike people that aren't un different people together who don't have the same experiences, I should say, together, maybe one's ex extrovert, one's introvert, or you know, male, female, different types of personalities and, and different things together. You're gonna get a much more curious group because you gotta find out what does the other person want? Because it's so different from what I would want. And th that builds that questioning and that builds emotional intelligence through the empathy that you're building. So I, I think that there's a multiple uh, different ways. The, the curiosity journey that I'm building is, is asking questions in a gamification kind of way to go up this mountain. And you can go up the four different fate paths of fear, assumptions, technology, and environment based on how you answer questions. So I think you can add gaming into classes and make it much more interesting. And uh, I've just been fortunate to work with people like Reed Hoffman's group and you know, really cool people who have all the technology to do that. But I, I, I think that uh, there, there's multiple ways and I think games can be really a fun way. I love the concept of matching people with different levels of curiosity and different interests and see yeah. what, can, what comes out of it. We can definitely practice that in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, read one of, one of the questions that I already captured beforehand, but I also see some, some amazing, interesting questions that, that happen after the fact, so I'm going to mix and match a little bit. Um, one of the participants in indicated that uh, my research on right brain processing as it relates to brain uh, laterality hopefully I didn't butcher that, shows mm -hmm. children's right brain develops first by ages three to four. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the left brain takes over in its development. And it is fairly operational by age seven. Now, we all know toddlers are curious, and that's one of the things you mentioned in your presentation. Right. And sometimes, uh, um, do you think it's possible to develop the right brain more as adults to, un to enhance that uh, curiosity mm -hmm. quotient? And well, why did the left thinking brain? <laughs> we know that the brain is very flexible. We, you look at some of the research behind emotional intelligence and the guys, that, I, I can't think of his name, the guy that put the, the, the spear went through his brain and he hurt his prefrontal cortex. Uh, Phileas, or I, I can't think of Phineas or something. Um, anyway, they found that he was able to redevelop certain parts of your brain. And then we know that emotional intelligence, you can redevelop some of these things. So yes, we can develop um, uh, curiosity and other aspects of personality as we, we uh, grow these new ways of thinking. But we know with curiosity from the P Max Planck Institute, uh, coining the curiosity uh, gene and all this other research that, uh, that the, the, there's these factors involved that make us want to do more, become more curious. And one of those factors is we release dopamine, which makes us want to develop more curiosity. So sometimes it's, you know, fear will hold you back, but then you can overcome that fear and you get this boost, you know? And so that's why curiosity is such a great thing to, to work on and to, to get this kind of development. Now, my research was in 18 and over, so I can't speak to the younger groups that, that you're talking about. I can give you the background that I found in curiosity in general. But in adults, yes, we, we do find that you can develop your curiosity. And uh, if the, the biggest way to do that is to discover what holds you back. And, and yeah. that's what my research was. And I'm gonna now try to mix and match a little bit from, from the open questions and the ones I captured from the chat pod prior. And we have just, uh, just a few minutes left. So we're gonna try to get, and, and a few of those questions are quite complex. So, so maybe just touch <laughs> the lot your answer and then we can do it after the fact. Maybe we can send some of the answers. But uh, okay. one of the questions is, and the, the participants asking the question is, is kind of a, apologizing. It is a bit controversial. Uh, so please, please take no offense. As a natural born woman, I've struggled for years to find opportunity. 
Now with the changes in our society, for better or worse, there are men that now identify as women. These men have enjoyed the benefits of being men and perhaps are already in a positions of power. But is it right to allow them now to take advantage of programs like this one that is designed for women? And, and this is something we're struggling now within the company that this lady works for. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how she's tying this into curiosity. I guess the, uh, uh, if we were to do a specific uh, 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 curiosity training that is, uh, that is catered towards promoting curiosity within women, she's mm -hmm. asking a little bit of a controversial question. Is that now fair to offer to men who now identify as women? Because she feels they were given a little bit more benefits beforehand. Uh, so it uh -huh. is a bit controversial. <laughs> well, you know, when I train men or women, it's the same kind of training that everybody gets. And you can mm -hmm. say that in any group. I'm not just training women. I'm not just training men. Every, everybody's at a different rung on the ladder. Being a woman, I probably didn't get the same advantages as an, another man did. And a lot of it is what we're doing from this point forward. And you, you can't change the past, but we can question things moving forward and use our curiosity to develop our skills. Because I, I know that I've worked around a lot of men that probably weren't as qualified, weren't as good at what I did as I could do it. And I, I didn't question that. And I think we need to question that because we need to uh, say, you know, status quo thinking isn't the way we want to go. We want to go to the next level. And I think that even, I think people appreciate that, that if you have good intentions behind what you're doing, that you're not trying to hold somebody back who maybe had an advantage or push somebody forward who really doesn't deserve it. I, I think we have to look at everybody as equal in some respects, and even though we may have had different backgrounds of things and experiences, because we've all had times when we've been discriminated against or something bad has happened. But, you know, to hold other people back doesn't make us move forward. So I, I really think that we have to help support everybody. Absolutely. And um, last two questions. We have many more, so I'm going <laughs> to end up emailing you. Uh, how right. can, Keep so them coming yeah, the second <laughs> last question. How can you use curiosity when your intellect appears to be uh, too aggressive? Uh, this is a bit familiar. So how can you use curiosity if your intellect is kind of uh, suppressing it with, with your aggressiveness? Well, I think that the way people ask questions and how they even present themselves is a huge uh, turn off or turn on to having somebody want to answer your questions, right? And I'm super hyper and sometimes I could come across as aggressive. But it's not an, an intention I have. And I think that if you, you soften what you try to say and, and you're questioning and say, you know, well, can I ask you a question and, I, and, and buffer what you're trying to say? Um, I really want to know this and I hope you understand this is for me to, to grow or, or just buffer what you're trying to say in a way that other people don't take offense to it. I think it, it helps to have that 360 evaluation of asking your your peers, your friends, your coworkers, different things. Uh, does this come across this way? And, and there's gotta be a few people within your circle who will give mm -hmm. you some um, good advice because as Maya and I know, we, we wrote about perception and perception of what we think it is could be a lot different from what somebody else thinks it is. And we all have different vantage points. And the way to overcome that is to develop our empathy and understanding of how somebody else is seeing us and putting ourselves in, in their shoes and get that vantage point. And, and that'll help us tone down our aggressiveness if it's too much, or if we're too meek, realize that we got to bump it up a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So the last question, and I literally have, no joke, approximately 10 additional questions that I will be emailing you. <laughs> okay. So uh, when you are curious and innovative, how would you navigate the situation with a boss who attempts to stunt your curiosity or keep you in a box? Wow, that's a good one because that comes up a lot. Um, you know, the thing is, I've, I've asked this of a lot of experts and a lot of coaches on my, my show. And of course, curiosity has to come from the top. Sometimes you can get these underground movements where you can get some, you know, people excited from the bottom up about ideas and, and kind of just the popularity of, uh, popularity of them will grow and other people will buy into it. But the truth is, if you have a CEO who really just doesn't value curiosity, sometimes it's time to cut bait and go on. I mean, that's what all of them will say. That's so I think you have to recognize, are you in the right company? Are you in the right position? How much power do you have to make this underground movement move a little bit so that maybe 
this leader will embrace it because sometimes leaders they don't always get it to be honest with you thank you so much diane uh, we welcome. will now go thank you so much terrific presentation lots of interest i'm going to send you a lot of questions <laughs> so you can oh, address it you. for our audience members and uh brandy havens our cwl board member will now wrap up this session and provide you with some uh important information so please stay tuned and go ahead brandy Thank you. A huge thank you to the amazing Dr. Diane Hamilton for sharing that very thought provoking message with us today. Um, I feel confident in saying we're all walking away inspired to not only embrace our own curiosity, but to strengthen it and channel it to promote personal growth and create change in our organization. So thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton, for being with us today. Now let's take a sneak peek at what is on the horizon here at the CWL. First, I would like to invite anyone who's interested to attend the annual Teaching and Learning Conference coming up in November. On Thursday, November the 5th, we will present the Center for Women's Leadership through a panel discussion featuring Executive Dean Bob Doherty, CWL co-chairs, Dr. Karen Ivey and Dr. Katie Theory. CWL board member, Dr. Maya Zilahitch. Moderating will be CWL board member, Dr. Irina Weislap. Additionally, representatives from various subcommittees are gonna be present to provide updates on membership, mentoring opportunities, and research. So this is a great opportunity to ask some questions, get some insider information, and just to learn more about the mission, the current activities, and the future at the CWL. Also, I want you to mark your calendars for our next webinar event coming up on January the 15th. This event will feature an all-star panel representing and celebrating successful women in technology. Lastly, a big congratulations to our 2020 Ashford University graduates. We are so proud of you. So thank you all so much for your attendance today, your participation, your enthusiasm, but most of all, thank you for your commitment to equity in leadership and for the positive examples that you set every day by being leaders in your families, in your communities, in your workplaces. On behalf of everyone here at the CWL, be well and always stay curious.